Christian friends, today I want to tell you briefly about a love affair. And this love affair is a love affair between myself and the particular text which we will today be discussing, that which has traditionally been called the story of the prodigal son. Now, this love affair in my life goes back for about 25 years. 25 years ago, I discovered that in the Middle Ages, in the Middle East, there was a very sharp debate between Muslim scholars and Christian scholars over the story of the prodigal son. The Muslims said to the Christians, look, you dum-dums, in this particular story, a young man gets lost. He obviously represents man in his sin, and he decides after he gets into some difficulties that he wants to return home. He yastaghfir Allah, he seeks the forgiveness of God, so he returns home, and the father, who represents God, welcomes him. And it's as simple as that. You have no incarnation, and there is no cross, and there is no redeemer, and there is no sacrifice, and there is no suffering, and there is no way of salvation, and there is no man made God, uh, God made into a man. And all of this nonsense, which you dumb Christians have dreamed up, is not there in the story. And this is the story which Jesus of Nazareth told, explaining to his disciples how mankind in their sin are restored to God. Therefore, Jesus is a good Muslim, and we don't know why you Christians fail to listen to his message. Now, I would dearly love, if you are in a class listening to this, to have you turn off the machine right now, give yourselves a week, and then wrestle with what on earth you're going to say to the sheikh. Because uh, it looks like he's got the best part of the argument. When I was suddenly confronted with this reality of a medieval debate, I said to myself, there's got to be something there that we're missing. So I went back to the commentators, and they said, well, you know, this story occurs in the middle of the travel document. That is, from Luke 9:51, which says he set his face steadfast to go to Jerusalem up until chapter 19 when he arrives, that all of this block of material, the central third of Luke, is told with the shadow of the cross over it, and that the cross is, super, is presupposed, it's superimposed on the text. It's there, you feel it. All right, he doesn't mention it, never mind. I grant that that's true. But this wasn't a good enough argument for me, as it certainly would not be good enough an argument for anyone who was not already disposed to accept it. Does Jesus, in fact, teach us that we can be reconciled to God without a reconciler? And if he doesn't teach this, what are we going to do with this story? This quest, this question, which was planted in my mind 25 years ago, led to a gradual search for what this story meant in the context of the culture of the Middle East in which it was originally told. And I have been privileged now to write this up in a little book for lay people called The Cross and the Prodigal, and it's written up also for scholars in a more extended work called Poet and Peasant. Let us try to look at just the high points of what my 25-year love affair has brought to me. Let's look at the story as we find it in a store as a story about Middle Easterners themselves talking as Jesus was as a fellow Middle Easterner to his fellow Middle Easterners. The first thing we start off with is that in the beginning, a young man requests his inheritance while his father is still alive. Now, I don't know what age you are and whether or not your parents are still alive. My saintly mother died two years ago. And when she was still alive, I did not say to her, look, Mom, you're getting old. I'd like a new car. Dad left a few bonds. Why don't you give them to me now? I'm going to get them pretty soon anyway. You're going to kick off before too long. I didn't say that to my saintly mother. I very much doubt if you have said anything of that kind to your parents. Because in the Middle East, and surely this is true for, in some sense for every culture anywhere in the world, to ask such a question means, Dad, why don't you drop dead? 
Now, in the Middle East, this is so specific and it is so intently felt that for 25 years I have looked for a story like this in the culture of the Middle East and I've not found one. We don't find anything like it in the Old Testament, Intertestament literature, early Jewish or Syriac literature, Arabic literature. I've tried all of them. I have never found in oral or in written fashion any story like this. This bomb which goes off at the beginning is so horrifying that nobody tells a story like this except Jesus of Nazareth. What is he? I did find two cases of people who had experienced this. One was a Syrian farmer in which the older son walked in on his father and said, I want my share of the family farm. And the father took his right hand and he struck the boy across the face with his hand, the back of the hand, which is an even worse insult, and drove him out of the house. And it took five years before the other brothers could reconcile the son again to the father. Another case I found was of a Jewish Christian in Tehran who was a physician, medical doctor. And one night, the wife called up the pastor, who was my student, saying, please hurry over. Our son wants his father to die. The pastor rushed over. What happened? Has there been a big fight? Did he pull a gun on you? No. He came in and asked for his inheritance. The father tried to say to the physician, look, it's a different age. These young people don't think the way we do. I'm sure he doesn't mean it that way. You mustn't be upset. The father was adamant. My son wants me to die. Three months later, the father, in previously good health, died of a heart attack. And the wife said he died that night, the night the boy came in and said, where is my inheritance? So how does this story begin? It begins with this enormously explosive bomb in which we are told that man in his sin, not God is dead, but rather God, man wants God to be dead, wants God to be non-existent, to have no authority over us. This is deep within the nature of our sin. We want no, no power with final authority over us. Now, the story is supposed to explode. The father is supposed to be angry. He's supposed to insult his son and drive him out of the house. Of course, there's no way in which he's going to grant this request. And immediately, the son is supposed to be the Kissinger or the, the Philippe Habib. He's supposed to start the shuttle diplomacy. And he's supposed to rush between capitals and try to make peace. He's supposed to go into his father and say, look, Dad, the kid's barely out of diapers. Don't take him seriously. I'm sure he doesn't mean it. Then he goes to his brother and says, no way. We're never going to accept this. Now, you've got to apologize. You've got to go back and tell your father that you're sorry. And then finally, they manage to make peace. There's a big party. They uh, embrace one another, and it's all over. This is what's supposed to happen. It doesn't. From the very beginning of the story, we know exactly what all three of these characters are like. We know what the younger son is like by what he does, what he asks for, sorry. We know what the older son is like by what he does not do. He refuses to be the reconciler. And we know what the father is like by what he grants. Now, according to first century Jewish law, a father if he wasn't under pressure, if he's under pressure, it doesn't count. But if he's not under pressure, he can make an oral will. He can say, OK, boys, when I'm gone, you get this and you get this. And according to Jewish law, the older son got two thirds, the younger son got one third. But if he made that oral will, the sons do not take possession, and thereby they can't sell, until he's gone. The father still has authority over the estate, and he has the right of the profits. So if it's an agricultural farm, the produce of the farm belong to the father, which he can use and spend and give away as he likes. If at the end of the year there are profits which he has not spent, they become a part of the capital, and he cannot spend them. And that's a part of the background of the story, which every listener to the story would have understood and becomes critical, particularly at the end. All right. 
So this young man not only presses that there might be a division, that he might be given his share, he presses for the right to sell, which is the second unheard of horrifying request. And indeed, as William Temple, the famous Archbishop of Canterbury, has said, God grants freedom to man, even the freedom to reject his love, the freedom to reject the, the love of God. And there is no pain more intense than the agony of rejected love, in which the lover reaches out in love, and that love is rejected. And in that rejection, there is the deepest suffering of the human spirit. The cross, the deepest pain of the cross, was not the six hours of torture. Many, many people in Hitler's torture chambers uh, experienced physical pain far more, far longer, and thereby far more excruciatingly painful than the cross. The pain of the cross, not discounting its physical side, but the real pain of the cross was the agony of rejected love. This love the Father experiences from the very beginning of that story, and it is, mind you, the path on which the Son will have to walk if he is going to come home. And without that path, there is no possibility of his considering returning. The Father, if he likes, can have a mock funeral, which sometimes people do in the Middle East, bury an empty box and say to himself, I no longer have a son. If he does this, there's no way in which the boy can return. All right. So the father grants this request, and he divides the living between them. The older boy gets his share assigned to him, and presumably it's the rest of the estate. He should have spoken up and say, No, Dad, may you live a hundred years. I don't want it now. But he's quiet. And we know a great deal about him from the beginning of the story. So then the next thing we're told is that after not many days, the younger son, and the old translation was gathered together all that he had. We now know that this particular Greek verb was a verb that the bankers used and means realized. It means turned into cash. He's not given his inheritance in so many stocks and bonds in a safety deposit box. It's not a sack of coins. He's given the d title deeds to property. This he has to sell. He has to realize it. He can't take it with him unless he sells it. So we're told he does this in a hurry. Now, how come in a hurry? Well, in the Middle East, the sale of property is a long and very uh, drawn-out affair. You spend months and sometimes years over the disposal of property. This fellow does it in a hurry. Why? because the village is mad at him. Okay, someone will buy. That's true. But as a community, they are very, very unhappy with him. And every home he goes to and says, I've got the South 40 for sale, the answer thrown in his face is, what? You're going to sell the orchard that your grandfather planted? What's the matter with you, kid? Don't you know you're selling your own soul? What has happened to you? What is your father going to do? This is his old age pension and on the conversation will go. So he's got to do it in a hurry and get out of there because the heat in the village is intensifying day after day, and he's got to settle at any price and get out, which he does. So he goes into the far country, and then we're told that he wastes his money in expensive living. The words in Greek have no hint of immorality. Hollywood has tried to tell us that he spent that money in an immoral fashion. His brother, at the end of the story, has some ideas about this, but the text itself does not say he spent it in an immoral fashion. It merely says he wasted his money in expensive living. And it's important for us to note that. All right? Sooner or later, the money is all gone. So now what's he going to do? Well, the obvious thing is he should pack up and go home. But you see, now he's embarrassed. He's embarrassed and he's afraid. Now, what's he afraid of? Well, the first thing he's afraid of is he is ashamed before his father because the father gave him the property and now he's lost it. 
And second, he's afraid of his brother because if he goes home, he will be eating off of the rest of the estate which has now been legally signed over as the property of his brother. And that which he eats is a part of that which the father has the right to distribute, which if he did not distribute by the end of the year would be added to the capital and thereby added to the capital which his brother will one day inherit. And his, cap his brother will have some very choice remarks to make to him at practically every meal. We know from the story itself that they were not in good relationships at the beginning. Had they been in good relationships, his brother would have accepted to be the shuttle diplomacy and would have gone back and forth and made reconciliation. Now he's going to go back and every meal his brother's going to say, you dirty so-and-so, you took yours and now you're coming back to eat off of mine. All right, but that's not his worst problem. His deepest problem is the fact that the village is probably going to enact a traditional ceremony. We know from the Talmud that in first century Palestine, the Jews had a very special ceremony across the, across the countryside that was called the Kizaza ceremony. And Kizaza cognates with Arabic Kizasa, which means the punishment ceremony. And this ceremony was if you were a Jew living in a Jewish village, and if you did one of two things, if you lost the family property to the Gentiles, or if you married an immoral woman, and if you dared showed your face, show your face back in your home village, they would get a huge earthenware pot and fill it with burned nuts and burned corn, and they would break it in front of you, and they would all cry out, so-and-so is cut off from his people. Now, we know he's amongst the Gentiles because these people are keeping pigs. And uh, Jews obviously did not keep pigs. He's probably in a Greek city, or that's probably the image that would be quickly conjured up in the minds of Jesus' audience. And so he has now broken one of the two requirements on the basis of which, if he comes back, the Kisasa ceremony is going to be enacted. This is kind of like the Amish-Dutch shun of Pennsylvania. If you know that community, they have a way of keeping people in line. If you break the rules of the community, then they invoke the shun, which means no one will talk to you, no one will give you a drink, no one will feed you, no one will hire uh, you, no one will uh, sell or buy from you. And as an Amishman, if you have land, it's kind of like solitary confinement out in the open, but at least you will be able to eat. This poor fellow is coming home with nothing, and the, if they enact this ceremony, he's not even going to eat. Curiously, this idea of the breaking of an earthenware pot, still, we still have it in the Middle East on two levels. And one is when you're trying to get rid of some neighbor that you just think is awful, after he leaves, then you say, let's break a pot by which you mean, I hope he never comes back. Or in the hospitals up in the mountains of Lebanon, the peasants who still preserve the customs of the ancient Middle East, when they go to leave the hospital, the last thing they do is to throw an earthenware drinking pot out of the window, and it goes crashing down on the sidewalk. I've had these things explode nearby. It's kind of a shock, but what they're saying is, I hope I never get sick again and I hope I never have to come back again to the hospital. The breaking of a pot means the total final separation. All right, they will probably, he thinks, enact this Kizaza ceremony if I go back to my village. Put it this way. Do you imagine yourself going back to the 25th anniversary of your graduating class if you're on relief? You know, I mean, if you can show up in a nice gray flannel suit and you've got a nice-looking wife and she's well-dressed and a pretty car sitting outside, and you can talk expansively about, well, yes, things are going fairly well down at the company, you're glad to go. But if you're a little bit shabby and you've got to walk and you're on relief and you don't have a job, you don't bother to go. My Lebanese friends tell me nobody goes back to his village having immigrated to the rest of the world unless he makes it. You want to show up and talk about how much money you've made and build yourself a nice little retirement stone villa there in the mountains to show off how successful you are. If you immigrated to Brazil and you didn't make it, 
then you'd better stay and beg in Brazil. It's too humiliating to go back and beg in your own village. But this fellow not only has gone off into the big wide world to make his fame and fortune and failed, he has offended the village and he has broken relationships with his family and he has broken his father's heart before he left. And now he's going to go back. Mind you, the issue is not the broken law. He hasn't broken any laws. The issue is the broken relationship. He has broken his father's heart on a very, very deep level by wanting his father to die. Okay, so this kid in the far country is ready to go and feed pigs because he can't face that return to the village. We know the story. Finally, he sees the pigs eating these pods and he says, boy, I wish I could eat that stuff. And he can't because his stomach won't take it. So finally, he decides, I'm going to go home. So when he does, what does he say? He prepares a wonderful speech. He says, I will go back to my father and I'll say I have sinned. Okay, there's his confession. And then I will say to him, fashion out of me a craftsman. Now we've translated this, make me into a hired servant. The word hired servant, misthos, is a different word from the ordinary word for a slave, which is doulos, or the diakonos, which is the house servant, the kinds of words that ordinarily we get. This is a special word. And Jewish scholarship has identified the fact that this word is the equivalent of the word skilled craftsman. And when he says, make me, he's using the word which was used for God when God made the world. Fashion out of me a craftsman. What's the point? The point is, I'm still young and strong. Okay, I blew it. Don't worry, Dad. You train me as a good carpenter, and I will save my wages, and I will pay you back one dollar at a time, and one of these years I'm going to have all that money paid back, and then everything is going to be square, he thinks. But you see, you and I know that the issue is not the money. The issue is, Dad, why don't you drop dead. Now, how much is he going to pay dad to make up for the broken relationship? If it's a matter of a broken law, okay, he can pay money, but it isn't. It's a broken relationship. Now, how is this going to be restored? Today, I insult you in public, and tomorrow I say, Joe, how much shall I make out the check for? Because I'm sorry I insulted you yesterday. And the offer of a check is now a deeper insult. You are now rubbing salt into the wounds. We have broken a relationship with God, and we keep coming back and saying to him, how many brownie points do I have to earn? How many laws do I have to keep? How many services do I have to attend? And then the, the, the account is going to be square. And our very attempt to do this adds greater fuel to the insult. He doesn't understand this yet. In the far country, he's thinking as a Jew, and he's saying, I know what is required, I know I've got to confess, and I've got to offer how I'm going to make up for my sins, and of course, as a craftsman, he's an outsider. He will live in the village, and he will not live at home. And he doesn't think he's going to go home until the record is square. Now, at that point in the story, the Pharisees who are listening begin to applaud. And they begin to say, that, say to themselves, aha, this young rabbi, we thought he didn't understand, but we see he does. You see, Jesus did not say to them, now look, fellas, you can't be too hard on these sinners. They've had a hard life. Don't you think that we could be sympathetic? No. He says, you guys think sinners are bad. I think they're so bad, they're like a man who betrays his family loses his property to the Gentiles, and ends up feeding pigs. That's what I think of him. Now, what's he got to do? Well, he's got to go through the Jewish repentance, says the story, this far. And at that point, we find the Pharisaic audience jumping into the story and saying on a very deep level, hey, that's right. This young carpenter has really got the whole thing all together. He understands our theology very precisely, and that's exactly our complaint. The people whom he's welcoming are doing this. Okay, he understands. Now let's see how the story is going to come out. 
Okay, so now put yourself into the framework of the mentality of this young kid who is now starting home and he's stealing his nerves for the entry into that village. The big houses of any Middle Eastern village are in the center for protection reasons. And the ancient villages of the Middle East usually had walls around them and doors. Nobody, except the very wealthy Greco-Roman landowners, nobody lived on their farm. The Middle Easterners themselves lived in villages, clear up through the 19th century. So he knows the minute he hits that village street, the people are gonna yell at him and they're gonna scream at him and they're going to tear his clothes, and they're going to slap him, and they're going to insult him. You who went out of here on your big white horse and your fancy ideas. You who sold the orchard of your grandfather. You who thought you were going to make it, Mr. Big, and leave your father to starve in the village. Take this, and take this, and take this. He thinks when he gets back to his father's gate, he's going to sit there for quite a while while the crowd sort of softens him up a bit. And then finally his father is going to let him back in and then there's going to be this ghastly scene in which he has to say, of course, Dad, I can't come home, but I'll work as a craftsman if you'll just get me trained. And then years from now he might make it back. But you see, his dad also knows he's not going to make it. And his dad also knows the village is going to be very hard on him. And his dad also knows they will enact the Kizaza ceremony. And so his father is watching that road because he wants to see that kid before the kid gets to the village. Now what does the father do? The minute he sees him at yet a great distance, he runs down that village road. Did you ever try and run in a choir robe? The ancient Middle East and much of the Middle East today wears long robes. You can't run in long robes until you pull them up like this. And when you do that in the Middle East, your underwear shows. And the Jews said no man could lift his robes because then his legs show, and this is considered humiliating. And there was even a debate amongst them as to whether or not you dared pull your robes even if there were thorns beside the path. And some of them said, well, if, it's, if his robes are going to get caught in thorns, okay, just enough to keep out of the thorns. But now this man, who all his life has walked in the stately pace of a gentleman, because Ben Sirach says, 195 BC in Jerusalem, a gentleman is known by his walk and, and those robes kind of flow along behind you and make a magnificent impression. Now this man is running down this street with his robes in his hand and all the toughs in the street say, look at the funny old man running down the street with his underwear showing. And now the son, having steeled his nerves for this confrontation, sees the father running the gauntlet for him. He sees the father in self-emptying love coming to him in a very costly demonstration of unexpected love. And when he sees that, he is broken and destroyed. And all he is able to say is, I am unworthy to be called your son. And he is restored by that act of grace before he even gives his speech. And so in its clearest fashion, we see both the incarnation, the father who comes and becomes a servant, and we see and hear the overtones of the cross. And in its clearest illustration, we find the costly demonstration of totally unexpected love, which melts the socks off of this kid. He now realizes the issue is not the money and I can work for this man for a million years and I'm not going to make up for the pain of his broken heart. And if it is to be restored, he's going to have to do it and all I can do is accept. And that's what he does. And that's what we do. Amen. <laughs>